Welcome and thank you all for being here. Today you're joining us for another Wine and Spirits Wholesalers of America webinar. It's titled Building Your Playbook from Pitch to Deal. The webinar series of virtual programs is designed to be a resource for craft, startup, small production wine and spirits companies dedicated in keeping the United States, the alcohol market, the global standard for innovation, consumer selection, value, and safety. With these seminars, we're one step closer to this year's WSWA brand panel. The information that will be presented by our panelists will help you navigate and ensure that you make the best presentation you can for the judges. And if you're not gonna be part of the brand battle, it will be just informative in helping you make the best presentations you can make to the different stakeholders that you need to support your brand. As promised, we've put together a great group of panelists to guide you through a better pitch. So with no special order, let me introduce you to this year's panelists. I'm just gonna start from the top of my screen. Uh, Luis Gonzalez, uh, CEO of Old Elk Distillery. John Bilello, CEO of, uh, of um, has a different name, of um, a Sweet Amber Distilling Company. And Ray Lombard, who is um, the Director of, of uh, U.S. Uh, Supplier Manager, Business Development at Southern Glazers Wine and Spirits. So let's get started with each one of you giving us a quick description of what you do, how you got to where you got. And uh, let me start with at the top of the screen with you, Ray. Tell us your story. Thank you. Um, I started off in the uh, bar and nightclub industry while uh, attending uh, hosp uh, hospitality management school at FIU. Um, after, after it was time to graduate and, and get into the workforce, I realized how much I missed the industry. So that's how I got into the uh, wine and spirits business. Uh, had distributor and supplier experience. Was fortunate to have my my career progressing involved at Bacardi, and later on when I uh, joined Southern. And uh, under the current function, um, the so the uh, supplier management and business development department at Southern oversees several things. It oversees the the servicing the planning, programming, and implementation across the country with our regional leadership for all nationally aligned and highly aligned suppliers uh, within our infrastructure, regardless of, as well as uh, the Multicultural Center of Excellence, uh, which is something we're very proud of. We've had our Multicultural Center of Excellence came about at the time of the merger in 2016. Um, it's always provided a strong commercial relationship with the community and a, and a commercial function. And uh, in these times, uh, we, we're very glad we invested in that because we we're ahead of the curve and, uh, when it comes to multicultural programming and engagement. And aside from that, we also do supplier insights and analytics. We provide um, all of our supplier insights and analytics for our, for our aligned suppliers. Terrific. Thank you, Ray. Luis? Sure. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Luis Gonzalez. A little bit of my background is a lot of my, my professional career was spent in consumer electronics. I uh, spent about 12 years over in Otter Products, Otter Box, a cell phone case company, and BlackBerry before that. Uh, really come from a background of speed to market and quality and innovation. Uh, it's, you know, in, in the electronics business, it's you wake up late on a launch day, you're $10 million behind. So bringing a lot of that speed to market and innovation to the spirits industry have now been here for about three and a half years, serving as a CEO for Old Dog Distillery with a phenomenal team and phenomenal ownership and structure behind us and uh, partnered with Southern Glazers Wine and Spirits um, across the country with a phenomenal distributor. So happy to be here today and, and uh, really enjoyed the spirits industry over the last three and a half years or so. John, please tell us your story. Thanks, Charlie. My name is John Bellello. I'm the CEO of Sweet Amber Distilling and, and it's a black and American whiskey brand. Um, I've been in the, uh, the spirits industry my entire career, uh, 18 years with Seagram in the US and overseas. And then in 2002, I went into the startup space and uh, started my, 
my, uh, my, my time there with uh, Milagro Tequila, followed by Avion Tequila, and uh, a, a vodka brand called Double Cross Vodka. And now I was one of the founders of, of Sweet Amber and Blackened American, which is a collaboration between uh, the band Metallica and the late, great Dave Pickerel. And I'm happy to be with you all today. Well, great. Thank you all for being here. So let's tee it up by first talking a little bit about what makes a great pitch. And Louise and John, you've obviously mastered this. You wouldn't be here if you didn't know how to make a great presentation. And Ray, you like me, you've heard a thousand of them. So you certainly have seen the good, bad, and ugly. So let's start with you, Louise, in terms of what makes a, a great presentation. Sure, thank you. In, in, in our minds and in my mind, what, what makes a great presentation is comprised of a couple of things. You know, internally here at Old Elk, we look at it as, it, as our win wheel. You know, what's important now and, and what is it that we need to present uh, to our distributor and our customers to be effective. So a couple of the buckets that we really focus on, first and foremost, it starts with culture. You know, everyone here is experienced having great employees. Everyone here is experienced having not so great employees. And culture is really at the forefront of everything. You can have the best price, you can have the best product, the best distributor, and if you have the wrong people, nothing works. So culture is at the front of everything. From there, it's really about brand positioning, you know, and not necessarily just a specific product in a specific category, category but what's the philosophy behind the business? Are you gonna be a house of brands where you're gonna be very strategic and, and intentional on in what you do? Or are you gonna be a branded house, you know, where you try to develop a product across one brand name and everything's for everyone. And unfortunately in, in our world, like other worlds, there's vanity and sanity that we have to really rely on. And, and vanity is trying to be everything to everyone at, at, at all points. And, and sanity is very targeted and strategic about what products you're putting into the market at what price point and, and at what time. From there, it really, really ties into intentionality. You know, how intentional have you been about your planning and your positioning. You know, the reality of it is, is that when you approach this industry with, with the intention to be a player in this industry, you have to be ready to be supplemental to your distributor and your customers and not distracting, right? You have to understand that, that our distributors have a large book of business and we want to just fit into that business and be supplemental to that. And that's where the intentionality comes in. You know, do you have the right inventory? Do you have the right price points? And then from there, you know, really we focus on supply chain. If you want to grow to be, uh, you know, a significant craft in this industry, part of not being distracting to your, to your distributor partners and your customers and being, being supplemental to that is making sure that you can deliver on what you say you're going to deliver. You know, we are just one piece of the book and all of our customers and we love the opportunity to play with it. But it, it, at the end of the day, you have to be able to deliver on the inventory and the value that you're going to put in front of the customer and your distributor. And the last piece that we really look at is really around strategic planning and business support. You know, there's a lot of brands that our distributors are focusing on every day. And you have to take ownership of your brand and you have to really drive it on the streets. You know, part of not being distracting to that is, is, is being there to work alongside the distributor and your customers to build the business plan, build the points of distribution and really drive and take ownership of your brand. So, you know, to sum it all up from, from our perspective, it really starts with culture. You know, how are you going to position your brands from a house of brands or a branded house perspective? And then supply chain, got to be supplemental and, 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 and um, of value to your distributor, not a distraction. Terrific, Luis. John, you've done this a few times. Yes, and, and, and building on what uh, Luis had to say, which I fully agree with, you know, for me and with regard to a pitch, it starts with passion. I mean, the fact of the matter is, is if you don't believe in, in your company and your product, uh, why would a distributor? Um, you know, what's your brand story? You know, what makes it different? You know, what are the unique selling propositions? Um, I think it's important to note, and, and, and I'm sure Ray will talk to this, that, that there are, you know, distributors are, are seeing, you know, three, 400 pitches a month and, and you need to, to stand out. Um, so for me, it starts with passion. But then, you know, what's the market gap that your product will fill? What's your background? What's your team's background? You know, what is in your experience and your teams that will build confidence with a distributor that you've got what it takes to deliver upon what you're promising? Because in the early days, 
your, you and your team, along with your steward partners, are going to do the heavy lifting. Um, it's, it's, you know, what are the liquid credentials? What's your supply? Because, you know, a lot of the questions that are going to come back on you are going to be, this all sounds great. But do you have the juice to deliver? Do you have the funds to deliver it? So there's quite a bit that goes into to, to the, the pitch. And we'll get into that as, as, as we move forward in the agenda. But I think, again, it starts with passion. It starts with knowing your product and your segment better than anybody else in the room. Charlie? Terrific, John. And Ray, as I said, you've heard it all. So <clears throat> so what resonates with you? What can you add to the conversation? It's uh, your brand's got to have the factor and there has to be passion behind it. Um, basically, you have to identify who your consumer is when you're creating your brand. Uh, you need to connect with that consumer. What's the value proposition that you have to a consumer? Uh, what's the badge value? When I drink this brand, I feel like X. The brand I drink, you know, insert this word here. Uh, says this about me, how people have a personal bond or a personal connection with a brand. And time and time again, that's how great brands are built. And that's how, uh, that's how you have people who will drive a General Motors car their entire life or, or have been drinking Patron for the last 25, 20 plus years, Crown, Crown Royal, multi-generational and so forth. It's because it, what how people identify with a brand. So what's the it value? That's, uh, that's very important. And then what the story, uh, there has to be some passion, uh, some passion behind, you know, the story of the brand. That's your DNA. It's, it's what sets you apart from and differentiates you from uh, the competitive set. And while there's crowded cat categories, if you have, if you have something unique, a unique proposition like tequila, for example, is a category that's just growing exponentially and Every day we're seeing tequilas come across our desk, but with that, there are some, it's either a unique package, a unique, unique process, a unique product, or, or, uh, or a, a spinoff of, uh, of that. And on the bourbon side, we're all, and the whiskey side, we're also experiencing that. And, you know, Old Delk and Lewis's portfolio, for example, they have, they basically have anything from uh, products for the bourbon aficionado, to an entry level drinker with you know with a, with a cream base to uh, some great fun flavored whiskeys, and it's how you how you position your products and how you identify with the consumer is what's most important. We're experts at getting it into in front of the, in, into the account. We can gain the distribution. We can share insights. We can provide insights as to what's happening. You know what the success stories are and we learn from, from, uh, from past mistakes and we share this with all of our suppliers, uh, but it's that connection with the consumer that's very important. Terrific. Thank you all for uh, sharing your stories and uh, mm -hmm. let's dig a little bit deeper into the product itself. And, and one of the things that we see is the field is crowded with products. There is no lack of product today in the marketplace in every category. There are a tremendous amount of products. So talk a little bit, and everyone is unique, but it doesn't make it unique in the minds of the consumer. What are the things that you did to make your brand unique that would help other people make, tell their story of how to make your product unique? How do you differentiate your product versus the competition? Uh, since there's so much of it. And let me start again with you, Louise. Sure, so there's there's a lot of avenues you can take, you know, and, and innovation is at the forefront of that. And innovation is not necessarily always related to a product or, or the liquid itself. It could be related to a, a process and or a, a strategy that's lending around a specific liquid in, in itself. And so for example, for Old Up, you know, we wanted to start and be very organic and and what we were presenting and what we were delivering. You know, we started our business in 2012, but we didn't commercialize until 2017, 18, around that time because it takes time for the liquid to age. For us, we started with really uh, being intentional about who was going to create our liquid and who was going to be a part of, of the family, if you will. And that started with the head of, of our master distiller. Our master distiller is 
Greg Metz and he came from MGP in the past and and really we want to deliver some type of innovation behind Mashville and that's when we created our very high malt Mashville. From there it was how do we create innovation in in the space of, of creams you know bourbon bourbon creams not a liqueur not a cordial but a, a bourbon cream and that's where our brand Nuku really came to life. And then you know as as Ray alluded to our flavored whiskeys it was really about creating another brand called Whiskey Smith and PBNW that really elevates the experience of, of, of that flavored whiskey. And it's not just a shot occasion whiskey, but really lends itself to different economical paths for on and off premise and, and really lends itself to an innovative uh, taste profile that you find within the flavored whiskeys. But at the start of development of products, it's really important to talk to your distributors and understand where are the gaps, as John alluded to. You know, where, where are the gaps within the portfolio? Because what you feel might be a home run product may not be um, that situation within the distributor. And, and, I, and I always like to use the example of, you know, none of us are, are physicians and doctors here. So it means we're not in the prescription business. We're in the listening business and the delivering solutions business. And so it starts with understanding where their gaps are and then trying to dive deep into what the consumers know to appreciate within a flavor profile and deliver a different twist that maybe helps consumers cross from one category to another. For example, our high malt bourbon, uh, you know, a lot of scotch drinkers are starting to like our high malt bourbon. It's got four or five times the amount of malt that a typical typical bourbon would have. And so it's how do we not only cater to the, to the, to the uh, very, um, seasoned drinkers, but how do we start to help and cross categories with drinkers and show them new products that they may not know or understand that they really like today? Right, terrific, John. So we, you know, we've had a, a bit of, 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 of a unique um, beginning in the sense that you know, obviously, celebrity brands have caught on quite a bit in in recent years, and when we founded when we founded Blackened. Uh, American whiskey. You know, we were the co-founder with a band Metallica, so we've got we've got celebrity there, and then we we needed to to bring in a superstar um, distiller to uh, to you know to to join these two masters of craft. So you know, Dave Pickerel was instrumental in us, and we, our first meeting with with the, the the band was very simply this: we know how to do music, but you know how to do whiskey. We want a fabulous whiskey, and the whole the whole preposition behind the band entering the whiskey business was another way to connect with their fans. So it became really important to us that this brand was authentic. It had to stand on its liquid credentials. It had to compete with whiskey aficionados, as well as, of course, the low-hanging fruit, which is appealing to Metallica fans. So we so we, we agreed early on that that uh, Blackened would be 80% brand, meaning about the, the whiskey itself, and 20% band, because we'd be foolish, obviously, not to leverage everything we could to, to bring awareness to the forefront and, and, I, and I think we succeeded quite well in that. And, and as, you know, we talked a bit earlier about, about you know, this pitch, and I think, it, I think it's worthy of, of diving in a little bit deeper there because, you know, obviously you, you need something that has a unique proposition to fill because as Charlie noted, you know, the category, every category today is crowded. And for me, you know, I always look at this is when you're presenting, uh, when you're pitching distributors, you know, this is Hollywood. You've got, you need some sizzle, you know, you need to break out. As we stated, there's hundreds of brands being presented on a, a, on a monthly basis. So in our, in our situation, we took our two celebrities, the band Metallica and, and Dave Pickerel, and we created a brand video. And, and what that, the whole intent was to show what the assets were that we were bringing to bear. So, you know, we had these music icons and how could we innovate and it, it just so had happened that Dave had had an idea, something that had sat with him for many years, where he felt that really low frequency sound applied to, to aging whiskey could enhance that, uh, those pre flavor profiles. And so what, we, what we, we kind of developed just by sitting around and, and quite honestly talking was what we call black noise, where we actually use Metallica playlists and we apply that low frequency sound to the aging barrels. This whiskey is all well aged to begin with. So it's not, it's not a gimmick. It's simply that the, the cavitation that's caused by that low frequency 
uh, hertz that's hitting those barrels moves it and it pushes that whiskey in towards the red line and at night when things cool down and it, it expunges out and it just adds additional flavor so that was something that was we were able to attract you know an interest from fans and 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 and, and music people in the metallica world and then it also gave us something to talk about with regard to some innovation on on the whiskey side um, and, and to that end, you know, we did this video, right? So with that kind of shows this process and, and that tends to get some attention. Now you've got that distributor's attention and it's, you know, it's time to move on to what I call the, the you know, the inverted funnel um, or the, or I should say the inverted pyramid or, or the funnel where you're starting broad and you talk about, you know, the category and, and particularly the, the, the market that you're, that you're presenting or pitching to, you know, whether it's a state of New York or for that matter, it's, 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 it, it's a county in, in, in Maryland. At the end of the day, what you want to do is you want to start to get into the specifics and, and, and start broad category consumer that you're targeting and then kind of narrow down and get very specific about, about your brand and what you, you know, what you bring to the table. And um, again, it's, it's category data, it's consumer and market uh, dynamics and how you're, you're, you, you see your product um, fitting in. It's also really important to ask questions. These distributors are experts in their market and obviously in, in brand building. So it's important to ask questions as well. And then you need to, you need to discuss your price, promotion, point of sale, support, you know, basically the why, where, and how. You know, what is your consumer facing uh, support look like? Advertising, PR, uh, social media, activations, your trade support, point of sale, again, sampling in store activations, events. These are things that, you know, this 360 degree approach to promoting a new product is what it takes not only to break through and get a distributor to, to want to want to rep your product, but this is what it takes in a dynamic and really crowded spirit space. One of the things I also, you know, also recommend is, you know, in advance of your pitch meeting, whether it's, it's via Zoom or in person, send your product samples send a one page spec sheet, sell sheet, so that those that are, you're gonna be meeting with already know some of the specifics. It's a six bottle case versus a 12, it's a 90 proof whiskey, it's a blend, etc. cetera. Um, and if you're meeting in person, bring those samples with you as well. And specifically, don't forget to make the ask. And that ask should be specific. What is it that you're looking to do from a distribution goals point of view? Are you focusing on premise? Are you looking more off premise? Are you looking at all territories in the state, just the metro area? These are things that are important for them to know with regard to their decision process, but it's also for them to learn about you. So all in all, I think, I, I think it's, it's one that makes sense and it's, it's kind of been honed over time and, it's, and it, it seems to have been successful for us. Charlie? So Ray, you know, you're, you're a little bit of the gatekeeper and you're sitting there with all those items and all that, uh, uh, those brands. What, what, is, what are you thinking about with the brand when the next one comes into your uh, office? What are you looking for? Um, and let's focus, I wanna focus on the brand and then we'll get into the marketing stuff. Um, or is that what it is? I'm less hung up on the brand and I'm more hung up on the support of the brand. What, what is your, when you're looking at this, what, how do you feel and what are you thinking? So first and foremost, what comes to mind is what are we drinking tomorrow? Um, a lot of times we, you know, there's crowded categories and, and, you know, other brands are coming at the same price point, similar package sometimes dangerously similar package and label uh, to, to category leaders. Uh, and that's, it, it, that's where, you know, going back to that it factor, how does that brand fit our portfolio? How does it fit within our selling divisions? Because there's distributors of all sizes, but the larger distributors like, such as ourselves, we have multiple selling divisions. So we could complement or, or fill a need or a gap within one of our selling divisions uh, with, with that specific brand. Uh, we have many great bourbons and they don't conflict with one another because they're handled by 
supplier will uh, separate selling divisions. Uh, so we look for the portfolio uh, the portfolio today. Uh, that's very important. And then the next is what support, what scale, what vision, what plans uh, that brand owner uh, is bringing is bringing as well. Uh, many of times you might have, you know, a producer might have forgotten a, a step in the supply chain process, including securing liquid for their aspirations or, or uh, sort, you know, sourcing the right resources to be able to bottle cap and, 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 uh, and, and place in a case, you know, their product. And uh, so understanding their supply chain their infrastructure, their business continuity is something that's important. So, so important that we, we offer a lot of uh, feedback in, in, that, in that area to our suppliers. And most recently, we, um, you know, as part of our commitment to growing, to growing uh, the craft movement, as well as through our multicultural center of excellence, we're doing, uh, we're doing an incubator academy. So it's for craft brands, minority owned brands, uh, we're going to start, uh, we're going to start in Q3, a coursework with content and materials, which is beta, it's going to provide modules for interested suppliers for everything from basic beverage, alcohol, mathematics to, you know, how do you craft that elevator pitch? As John was speaking to, you know, you know, before you have that ask, what's your story and the samples and and so forth. So, you know, crafting that elevator pitch and uh, these workshops will also be hosted with a lot of industry leaders on the supplier and distributor side. And it's something that we're gonna do as we, as we continue to enhance our, our uh, craft capabilities and emerging brands. Terrific. Let's talk a little bit about what's important to the distributor. You know, and in your experience in going to the distributor, you know, distributors think deeply about their margins. They want to know about the marketing support. They want to know about the manpower that you have to support it. Um, when you look at those things, what do you think are the most important things that you have found um, that are important to the distributor? It'll be interesting to hear what you say, Louise and, and John, and then Ray, you'll give them your perspective. So I'd like you to talk about the things that are important, and then I would like you to weigh them a little bit of what you think is the most important to the least important. So what what would what do you think, Louise, in terms of what are the most important things that you found in in working with the distributor? What was the most important thing that resonated with them that you brought to the table? Yeah, so that's a that's a great question, and there's there's so many there's so many things that come to mind. So I'm gonna try to get them out and then try to align them here. So you know, I think I think it starts with the plan. You know, before you even go in there, I'm a big believer of build a plan, work the plan, and the numbers will come. You know, if you chase the number, the behavior changes, and if behavior changes, then you know there's 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 one sided decisions being made. So for us, it was really about. Let's take the time to build the plan and make sure that we're touching on several things within that. Margin's one of them, okay? Margin is one of those things that, in, in our belief, be healthy for our distributor because they've, they've got bills to pay, we've got bills to pay, and if we're asking to be a big part of that business, we need to be a healthy part of that business. We don't need to be uh, uh, downselling or taking away from the overall profitability of that distributor. So margin is, is an important one, and it's really the supplier's responsibility to find margin savings downstream that you know, can be passed on to the distributor. You know, as you grow to be that larger supplier and that larger partner of that distributor, that doesn't necessarily always mean let's start constraining the margin on their side. So as your business grows, it's your responsibility to really find a way how you can pass through that value to your distributor. From there, it's product, product category. And, and this is assuming that the taste of the product is there. Everyone's tasted it and everyone really likes it because really, you know, if, if you taste the product and it doesn't pass the taste test, uh, I, I, it's a conversation might be over pretty quick, but I think that, you know, once you get past that point, it's really about the product. And a lot of people say, well, I want to have a $70 product. And are you positioned well for that $70 product? And back to that vanity and sanity, you know, sell in 
of a $70 product is vanity and sell through of a $70 product is, 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 is sanity, right? And so it's really trying to understand what is their strategy and where are their gaps from either a product positioning, a product category, or a product price point. It's really important as a supplier that you work on your price to really um, stay honest and true to yourself about what velocity means. Different price points are going to carry different velocities, and, and it doesn't mean that you need to stack your portfolio with one or, or spread out across others. So a lot of communication back and forth with the distributor is early, is important to understand where are their gaps, as I mentioned before. And, and, and really being able to bring that to the table. You know, I think I've told all of our distributors all the time, you know, if there's a gap in the portfolio, we want to be the person you call first. In order to get that call, they have to know that that business is going to be healthy for them. And then from there, it's the volume, you know, how is it scale? Because you're always going to be putting pressure, you know, respectful pressure to grow the brand and be in the places that you're supposed to be. What happens when it hits? You have to be ready to really grow and scale the business. You have to maintain that confidence within the distributor that really lends itself to being supplemental to their business versus putting a lot of work and effort behind that product. And all of a sudden it hits and you have to make that phone call that we're out of inventory and that nobody wants to make. Right. And so um, to sum it up, you know, I think. First of all, you know, product, the category is incredibly important because if it's not the right category, the margin doesn't matter. Right. And then it's availability. And if your availability availability is there, that the margin can be sustained and that business can really be planned into the overall budget of our supplier, of our of our distributor and of our, our, our customers. And then it's supply chain. If you cannot uh, deliver what you say you will, you will not get another shot a lot of times. And so it's really about you know, keeping the business healthy, understanding where you can be a value add above and beyond what you think is a value add, and then making sure that you can deliver that. And all those things together, you know, product development, innovation, aggressive growth, managing the cost and passing margin. And the center of that is that unicorn for all suppliers that is profitability and growth, right? And so if you don't have uh, those buckets driving for you, then you are a distraction to the business. Terrific. And John? Your thoughts. Building on, on what Luis had said, you know, for me, it's, you know, when you look at what's important to distributors, it's, it's, it's pretty simple stuff, right? First and foremost, it, you know, you've got an aged product and what they want to know is, particularly if you're asking for multi-state distribution is, is, you know, do you have the product to supply uh, that need should, should the product hit? And, and that goes hand in hand with, quite frankly, are you reasonably funded to achieve your goals? Um, you know, is, you know, if you're looking at, at, at an on-premise focus or for that matter, an off-premise focus, do you have the point of sale that's needed to support the trade? Do you have resources dedicated to in-store samplings? If it's on-premise, you know, in-store, uh, on-premise activations, events, et cetera. Do you, and will you have boots on the ground? This is critically important. A distributor has a huge book and, and they're, they're taking a chance on a new brand, particularly if it's, it's coming from an unknown supplier. So will you have boots on the ground in market or is it more regional in nature? You know, where are you currently in, in distribution? So if you're in distribution in another state, you know, what did those results look like 90 days in, so to speak? Um, what is your rollout plan? Are you looking on a state by state basis or are you looking to roll out regionally? And this is really important. And it comes back to resourcing again, because every market you open requires attention. It's not like you go in for a week and you move on. I mean, every market that's open requires a, a substantial amount of, of uh, attention, and that requires not only boots on the ground, but the resources to, to get around it. You know, um, and then, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? Where do you see yourself in three to five years? And, and, and that's important because, again, back to not only supply issues, but are you, are you moving both the funding of the brand as well as the resourcing of that brand, whether it be human or, or others. So these are all things that are important to communicate. And I think um, uh, Luis alluded to this earlier, the thing that the, the biggest piece of advice I could give you is that this is a very small business. As large as we are, we're small and do what you say you're going to do. The kiss of death with a distributor network is to make a lot of promises and then fly back off home and never deliver. That's the, the absolute number one thing. Do what you say you're going to do. Great call out. 
So Ray, how well did they do? They did outstanding. Uh, simply to recap, and it's you know having your vision. What's your brand vision? That plan. Uh, having have having thought that out. Um, the numbers have to make sense. Uh, the numbers has to make sense for everyone. Has to make sense for the retailer or the restaurant or the on-premise account. It has to make sense for the distributor, and it has to make sense to you, the the uh, craft distiller, the supplier. Uh, so you know, making sure that your aspirations are 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 being backed by the numbers are very important. Is, is very important. Um, the support and infrastructure to help facilitate those sales. But for the most part, that's education and consumer awareness. Those are two areas that, you know, that we discuss with our suppliers, um, especially on the resource side for education. It's very important. And uh, luckily technology has become much more affordable through the years. And uh, we could use learning management systems. We could use uh, web portals, et cetera, to quickly educate a sales force that's going to be started that's going to start selling the product tomorrow we could quickly and swiftly educate them uh yesteryears you had to jump on a plane go sit in a room and you had 10 minutes to speak to 300 sales people in the room times are times of change and you know leveraging that technology what tools such as those do you have available or are you willing to work on because we we could we could uh provide the resources but the content and and the insight would have to come obviously from, from the brand owners and uh, ongoing collaboration and, and a long-term partnership. That's what we look for. Uh, if, we're, if we're building, if, you know, it's our baby, it's both of our babies and we're gonna nurture it and, 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 and it's gonna grow. So with that, uh, we, you know, we wanna, we wanna be part of the family. All righty, very good. So I wanna change it up a little bit and I don't know, Ray, how, if you'll agree with this or not, but realistically, um, as a small producer coming into a large house, the opportunity to get quota mentions are not really that realistic. We have large portfolios. So how do you go about winning the hearts and minds of the sales force without it being on the quota sheet? What have you done? And let me start with you, John. Um, First, in terms of what have you found in your experience that works best? Is it the sales just being there at the sales meetings? Is it doing work with? Do you try to get incentives without being on the quota sheet? What do you find are the best tools um, to win the hearts and minds of the sales force? You know, that's a great question. I mean, you know, we've, we're fortunate in the sense that we, we've got boots on the ground. And, and um, not only do we have boots on the ground, but we've got experienced people. And the, and, and the reality is, as I stated earlier, most of the heavy lifting in the beginning is gonna come from, from within your own organization. And I think that, you know, Charlie, you had mentioned this on a conversation we had previous, that, that the best thing you can do is make relationships with the salespeople on, on the street. Because at least initially, you know, until there's some momentum and some awareness and some acceptance, that will start to get around. But you're also going to need access to accounts that you don't necessarily have. And that's where the that's where the distributor sales team comes in. Um, but I also think that we're very fortunate in, in, in the period we're in, in in the world in the sense that we have options that we didn't have years ago. We've got the ability to create awareness online through through not only our websites and our ability to use third party um, retailers to actually uh, enable purchases. But more importantly, you've got you've got the advent of social media and the ability to, to literally digitally target. So you can do a lot for awareness to, to kind of pre pre sell your consumer uh, in a very efficient way, which back in the day it was it was outdoor and, and radio and, and, and print ads and, and so forth. Now you've got a lot of more reasonable options to create awareness. But at the end of the day, it's liquid to lips and it's it's getting your story out. And and that that really does take um, that does take boots on the ground working with your distributor. Louise? Yeah, so Charlie, for, for, for us, you know, I, I always go back to the, the very first piece about not being distracting to the business, right? 
um, it's communication first with us. You know, if you're not on quota, it means that there's other priorities within your distributor and you have to understand and work within those priorities, distract from those priorities, because ultimately you need those to be successful. So you have the opportunity to be part of that program as well. So, you know, it doesn't mean just go in and start forcing your way everywhere, but it does mean own your customer the path to market you know we have feet on the street as well really drive into a consumer and when you win the hearts and minds of not only the reps and consumers it's because you're going beyond the bottle you're going beyond the transaction you know anyone can do transactional business and it's really about understanding where can we fit in where are the opportunities and sometimes our people ask you know where where do you have issues within your account forget about our products you know, where are you losing traction in other categories and how can we come in and either supply tastings, meet and greets with our master distillers, innovation to that, to that, uh, to that particular account or really drive a value add that gives you the acceptance to be in the store, number one, gives you the opportunity to be part of the sales uh, in that location. And then once you get into there, you can really start to drive your plan and expand your footprint, but you're doing it all in a very respectful manner and a very timely manner that you're not disrupting what is already planned in that business. And so I think when you approach it from owning the customer and owning the hearts and minds and taking that accountability and responsibility to get that product in the store, you know, the distributor will, will, will start to come along. You know, um, like we said earlier, there's thousands of brands and, and unfortunately, ours isn't the one that keeps the lights on just yet, right? But it's, it's about building to that and building in, at a great pace and really respecting that priority. And then all of a sudden, one day you wake up and you have a lot of opportunity and now it's time to execute. So we have a philosophy over here where it's we're going to shoot, you know, we're going to shoot a lot of bullets at opportunities. And when we hear the pain, we're going to load the cannon and shoot it in the same direction. And, uh, and, and that's what we focus on. And so, you know, communication, respecting the priorities, taking ownership and accountability of your own brand and your own product and making the investments behind feet on the street and, and, and really owning your customer. That's how we've approached it. Both of you, great answers. Ray, what's the advice you give smaller suppliers coming to the house in terms of how they can better connect with the sales force? Um, there's uh, many ways to connect with a sales force and be prioritized. It's not just a quota. And quotas will vary by selling division. They'll vary by premise, et cetera. Uh, outreach. Uh, you know, we use use the resources your distributor has, has be it their, their uh, social media platforms and the social media team that supports that platform. Uh, use that. Use the supplier's internet, internal uh, communication portals. You know, like in, in our case, we have one which is SGNN. So whenever we have new happenings, new occurrences, new brands, and uh, new programs, and so forth, we use we use that as 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 a resource, and it's available to our suppliers. So uh, you know, engage and and ask uh, what's available outside of just a quota. Uh, Quotas could be made, quotas could be missed. Uh, profitability and profitability is important because sales reps are performance based financially. Their, their, their income is based off of you know, the, the financial results they deliver. So having a profitable brand that's going to accelerate that velocity for them and is going to deliver that paycheck every other week uh, that's going to be growing, that's important to them. And also how it fits that selling division's uh, needs. If, if, the rep, if the rep does not have a, a flavored or peanut butter or flavored uh, whiskey at the time and that, uh, that fit the need, I can assure you that that rep knows where the number one, uh, his number one, two, and three peanut butter whiskey count is, and they'll be going in pitching that brand. So it's how, it's not just it's not just about the quota. It's about the brand proposition, the financials behind it, and how you engage uh, how you engage uh, the, uh, the not just the distributor sales force but the consumer. Terrific, all. We're getting close to the end. Um, I'd like you to talk a little bit about um, your small company. You just started out. How many markets do I go into? What defines when you go into a market? Is it the key is to get there out as quickly as possible? 
Is it based on the resources you have? What what made you decide to how many markets you went, went into? What were the guiding principles? Let me start with you again, John. Thanks, Charlie. So our situation was somewhat unique in the sense that uh, we launched we launched Black End uh, at the same time that that Metallica launched a North American tour. But we specifically selected markets that were smaller. Uh, and the reason for that is, is while we had an absolute plan to open markets uh, throughout the year, there's important learnings, you know, regardless of how many brands you've introduced, every brand is unique. And, and of course, every market is unique, but you will, you, you will learn critical thinking along the way. And you, you know, you want to, you want to do that in smaller markets so that you can, you can adapt as necessary. So in our situation, we opened in Madison, Wisconsin, and then we, the next market wasn't for another two weeks or so in, uh, in upstate New York. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, we did smaller markets because a, you wanted to learning, but B, it takes a lot of account servicing and you don't want to just walk away. So it takes resources, human, quite frankly, to, to do that. So our approach was a smaller rollout. We, we um, rolled out two small markets and, and interestingly enough, uh, we're with uh, Empire in New York and we had such a, such a, a great uh, rollout in, in upstate that downstate asked us to launch. So clearly we accommodated. Um, and so my, my view is to take it, take it slow. It, it, you're able to then utilize your resources, you're both financial and human, and you also learn critical, uh, critical learnings along the way. Charlie. Terrific. Luis? Yeah, Charlie, so, so our, our approach is a little different, you know, and I think that it, it really had to do with the commitment of our ownership and, the, and the, really the mind frame of our ownership and, and the executive team here at Old Elk in the sense that, you know, when we wanted to enter this business, we wanted to be very intentional. We wanted to be a large player like other great crafts have become. And so for us, our dedication was we're going to take a very significant investment very early uh, around 2011 and 2012 and, and lay down a significant amount of product and then take the next two to three to four years to really build out our plan while that product was coming to, get to age. And so, you know, um, uh, thankfully for us, we had an opportunity to, to have great distributors uh, that trusted in our product, trusted in our plan, our volume. And we were able to, to really expand pretty quickly into all 50 states within about 21 months of launching our brands. And so, you know, still working to really get some of our other brands as Whiskey Smith and PBNW and Nuku and into, into a, a wider range of opportunity. But really our old Elk bourbon lineup is what led the way, uh, you know, hot category at the right time and, and, and great planning behind it and, and more inventory to scale. You know, resources are really going to depend on that. I don't necessarily think that there's a, a a wrong way. I just think that everyone's very unique in how they've prepared for the industry, which ultimately will determine how quick you can move. Speed, again, is, is at the forefront in the DNA of everything we do, but speed and quality have to be together. Um, and you cannot, you cannot um, lose quality to gain speed. And so um, for us, it was a lot about the preparation and then being able to, to get out there quickly in, a, in an industry that, you know, thousands of brands are pitching every, every, every couple of days. So um, we had a great opportunity of expanding quickly, but we had the inventory and the plans and the, and the resources behind us. So Ray, you know, you have a small guy coming to you. He has aspirations. Let's say he even has the juice to go into all these markets. But does he have the resources? Do you measure? Do you, do you encourage him? Because you can put him in so many states so quickly. But what what do you use as guidelines to go into all your markets? Go into a few. How do you make that decision? It all depends. It, the answer is it depends. It depends on the brand. What's happening? Are you an early entrant into the category, or are you bolting on to a category? And uh, a lot of times starting small is a good strategy because that's where you get to, to learn, evolve, pivot, and grow. 
Uh, so much so that we've had some great success with brands that have started off as a regional or local brand and has expanded into neighboring states and later on uh, it got gone national. Um, just recently, we put out a open letter to craft distillers where we'll, we'll take on craft distillers in their home market to create that opportunity for craft distillers. Uh, so that's a great entry level. If you, can, if you can't win in your backyard, if you can't win amongst your friends and your neighbors, it's gonna be challenging. Uh, so that's, that's, uh, that's one approach to take. And then the other approach to take is if you have a unique brand that fits a niche, in a category that is starting to grow or, or fastly evolving uh, at that at that point in time you want to look at your your infrastructure and what the potential is to to uh, launch nationally terrific i'm going to start uh, taking some of the questions that i've seen popped up i'm going to package two of them together uh, there was a question about using brand managers versus um not brand managers, brand ambassador, a one really good brand ambassador, or do you want uh, feed on the street, not a brand ambassador, but a more of a salesperson? And do I use a broker versus a, a full-time employee? Um, do I need a person per market? Give us your thoughts about um, those type of employees, associates that you hire. John, so in, in you know both both Luis and I uh, are fortunate enough to have master distillers on 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 the payroll. So, you know we we use we use Rob Dietrich, who is the gentleman who replaced uh, Dave Pickerel after his passing, and and Rob obviously has a lot of it on his plate. But you know he is our main spokesman for the brand. So if if you will, if we have a national spokesman, I don't like to call him a brand ambassador, but he's our master distiller. He's out doing interviews. Views. He's out there um, with on-premise accounts, training sales forces, etc. So we try to keep Rob on the road as much as possible. Obviously, during COVID, he was doing it through Zoom and, and, and other ways. But that's 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 kind of a national spokesperson slash educator role. I, I quite frankly. Um, Charlie, don't feel like you can get away from having salespeople on the ground, particularly early on. That does not mean that you need to have a, a dedicated resource in every single state, but you have to have at least a regional resource that can get to those states on a regular basis because early on, you're gonna be doing the heavy lifting and it's important to, to have boots on the ground. I, I don't think there's, it's, I, I don't really think it's feasible to do it. And, and again, I'm sure Ray will, Ray will agree that that's one of the first questions that gets asked in a distributor pitch meeting is, is who are you going to have in market? Great answer. Thank you, Luis. Yeah, yeah I agree with John on, on a lot of those things. It's, you know, for, for us, we have our master distiller, Greg Metz, who's been distilling for, you know, 43 years now, uh, has distilled many of the brands that are sold today. Uh, as the head distiller at, at MGP, but I think it's it's really important to not just have one person. You know, Greg is very very uh, much responsible for our liquid and our bourbon strategy and our distillery strategy. But you know, part of part of always answering the call is having multiple boots on the on the ground and and she, and, and, uh, and individuals and markets because you know when you're relying solely on one or two people to really be everywhere the truth is you can't be everywhere at, at every time and, and inevitably what happens is you're going to get a call from five or six different markets who say hey you told me if I needed something to call you one day I had somebody who just backed out and I need somebody to be here in the next 12 hours um, well if you only have one person that person is more than likely booked up and you cannot your commitment of being a value add to that to that sales rep or that executive within the distributor. So I think it's really important to spread the resources, you know, not justify the many, um, but but really pay the hardworking few that are going to be available at, at all times and, and, and serve our customer. You know, our customers are distributor and we need to serve them and be ready to serve them as well as our consumers and our customers um, who are taking our products. So, you know, one one uh, major brand ambassador, you know, if you're a, a larger spirits company, you can maybe 
maybe get away with something like that. Um, for us, it's about making sure that we're ready and able to answer the call when it comes. That's what we ask for is the call. So you have to have people to, to answer and drive that strategy through. So we like to really have many people out there to, to support the markets, to support our distributors. Right? I mean, you have to live a day in and day in and get it done. The guy, a small supplier is limited resources. Are you, what are you telling him? Manpower versus promotion versus brand ambassador, broker. How do you tell him to best wisely use his limited resources? The uh, brand ambassador uh, brings authenticity to the brand, personifies the brand, tells the story of the brand. So having and many times it's the brand owner or the distiller um, who, who brings that authenticity. So that's almost another hat that you would have to be wearing. With that said, it is important to have a commercial and a supply chain infrastructure on your end uh, because questions come up and it helps our suppliers expand across markets, but every, doing business in every market is a completely different experience. Uh, business changes, you know, freight constraints, uh, tax, tax change, you know, taxation, et cetera. These are all just recent things that have that come up and we have to have discussions with somebody and they're usually, they require agility and they acquire uh, you know, some educated decision making on both ends and having somebody that has that sales management experience and that market expertise or insight, be it a broker or be it, be it uh, an in-house uh, sales manager or sales deployment is important uh, as well. Uh, and ultimately customers, as they connect with the brand customers being the retailer, the restaurant tour, uh, the nightclub, as they make that bond with the brand and they bring in that bottle and two weeks later they order the case and a couple months later, He's got a he or she. He's got a dolly of five cases coming in. They want they they they're already identifying, creating that bond. They want to know you. They want they they it it becomes personal. So having that engagement in the market with the customer, telling your story, uh, you know, uh, sharing thoughts and ideas, and thanking them for for being part of the success goes a long way as well. So it is. Uh, uh, we have three minutes left. We have one question that is in the question box. So I want to be respectful. It's really left field. But um, in one minute, the person asked, how important is the digital strategy in that presentation? I mean, in terms of differentiating yourself, having a strong digital presence, strong digital marketing, how important is that to your success? Um, Ray? Digital marketing uh, is becoming more and more important. Uh, COVID, for example, we we've successfully launched many brands through COVID. Uh, we were actually able to revitalize a lot of brands uh, during COVID. And a big part of it was the digital platforms. And it, it, it's the, the, B2C, uh, the B2C platforms, but it's also the platforms that distributors have to connect with the customers. Uh, so we have, in our, in our case, we have SG Proof, which is a full catalog. We're open for business 24 uh, seven across, uh, across all of our markets. So our customers can go in, shop, learn, and set up their, set up their deliver their orders or deliveries there. And not only does that digital marketing aspect, uh, not only is that important, but also all of the different expertise and, uh, and marketing resources that distributors will bring to you so that you can engage the, the likes of a Drizzly, Reserve Bar, et cetera, and all the opportunities that live up there because that is a channel that, that was, uh, was evolving at a very quick pace through COVID. It accelerated and the adaption, the adaption rate uh, was off the charts and it's here to stay. So it is very important. Digital marketing and commerce is uh, more important than ever. Uh, before you spend a dollar on another bar mat, uh, creating 
you know, a replica bar mat of the last thousand, uh, how do you take that dollar and how do you stretch it in uh, digital communication? These days, uh, 10 seconds on one of these on Instagram and you told your story uh, across, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands or millions of people if, if uh, you it's play two right o'clock. Thanks, Ray. It, I'm only pushing it because it's two o'clock and I want to give Luis and John one minute uh, on this topic of digital marketing and the importance of for the brand owner. Yeah. So I, I you know, Charlie, I, I think it's critically important. I mean, first of all, it, it needs to be for your company because it's efficient. Um, it's 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 a lot cheaper to get a lot of to get a lot of connection and awareness with the consumers out there through digital means than it than it is through more traditional media. On top of that, when you combine your your digital footprint your social media footprint with what should be a super strong um, website for your product. You're, you're giving the consumer everything they need. You know, they go, they're interested in your product. They go to your website. If your website is, is in my view, properly built, you have an opportunity through Thirsty or others to, to actually buy the product so that you can sample it online. And then you're, you're creating a conversation, right? Social media is about being social. So it's not about throwing constant, you know, ads and pictures of things. It's about creating a dialogue with your consumer and making them interested in what it is you have to offer. Louise? Thank you. And Louise, in one minute, what's your thinking? One minute. No, I have to agree with you. I think it's incredibly important to do the business because one thing that you always want to measure is your aided and unaided awareness, right? If you think that you're growing as a brand, how do you use the tools and technology to understand whether people are really talking about you um, or whether your unaided awareness is growing across the country? Furthermore from that, you know, aside from a, a conversion strategy to convert those consumers, it's what's in it for them. And it's all about education. You know, you want to be able to provide the education and the outreach to win the hearts and minds of the consumer. Remember, it's always about getting beyond the bottle, beyond the transaction, and how do you really become part of that house? And there's no better way to approach it from a digital strategy standpoint with the data that you have to really feel the mistakes and, and learn from them and, and tailor your pitch and or tailor your value add or educational approach to those consumers that you have at your fingertips. So an incredibly, an incredibly uh, large piece of the strategy. Uh, conversion is a whole nother story, but hearts and minds is at the forefront of everything in education. Well, thank you very much, all of you. Uh, let me close this out by thanking you all for sharing your knowledge, your experience, your, your talent. Uh, though this is a fun business, we have a great time. It can be brutal if you do not know what you're doing. So the fact that you were able to take your time and share this valuable knowledge is much appreciated. I know to all the listeners, uh, thank you for being here and only the very best to you and your family. Stay healthy, be well, and thank you all. Thank you, Charlie. Take thank care. You, Charlie. you all have a great day. Thank you.